Your father works very hard for his money, and you waste it all on records. Okay, so here we are at Acoustic Sounds in Salina, Kansas. This is the main part of Chad Kassam's uh, empire, and believe me, it is an empire. So let's go in and take a look through the front door. So each there's like each corner of this place is like a little nook that's a that's an homage to a to a certain label. Yeah, honorarium to uh, Nat. There's your Nat, your Nat section. Yeah. Was, was not me. You want to interview I wish it was me. It's amazing what goes on here. This is well, we'll, uh, we'll start with the, the offices, then you guys can go on and see the pressing plant, the, the warehouse. Which are, it's a Japanese flute. Oh, All right, we're on the, we're on the outside of quality record pressing in Salina, Kansas. This is the infrastructure. You can see that they are pressing records. You can see the smoke coming up. So, oh, there's a door. There's the way. Now I found the way. Just in time for a new group. Awesome. Perfect yeah. timing. Have a good day, Mike. Thank you. Alright, I'm going to go this way. TPC from Thailand. Here is the QRP Fitness Center, right here. <laughs> same plant as the American version. Same lacquer, one went to an American plating facility, one went to a British one. The British one, the records sound completely different because that part of the process is so critical to what you end up with. It's, that's where Gary's secret sauce comes in. Let's go ahead and we can kind of step in here. I think Stan has something to show us. 
the one that it ain't it works at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what's so amazing about it. That it works at all. Oh. I know. It's, it's so, there are so many steps, <laughs> and, and each step has to be formed correctly to make really good vinyl. Uh, is that why sometimes people ask, well, why do records cost so much? Yeah. There's a lot of labor involved, mm -hmm. not to mention raw material cost and other things. Is that the third sure. step of the plate? That is the final, yes, that is the, right, the three-step process results in a stamper. Jimi Hendrix, The Who, Pink Floyd, Trot Soundtrack. Trot Soundtrack. Primus. Just about everybody but Led Zeppelin. And some of you, it may be hard to see this, but try to get around. Okay, so when I put the mothers in the tank and I put them in there to, to start plating, obviously they look more like this. This is what your mother's going to look like when it goes in. When I pull it out of the plating tank after it's plated for two hours, it looks like this. It has this plating attached to the surface of the front of that mother. So what you have here is actually a mother and a stamper. I'm going to do real quick and break them apart. And that just happens with a tool here. Uh, you just get in between the layers like that. And then when you get in between the layers, it just comes apart like wow. that. And then you have the mother, which goes back out and just runs stampers all day like a slave. It's a hard life for a mother. <laughs> and then you have a stamper, and actually it's got a hard life too because it's got to go out to the press room. But that will actually get formed like the one I'm getting ready to do here into a stamper. And this one over here I've already sanded, but I got it on the centering table. And what this is, is it's a magnetic centering table. And how it works is there's a camera on the side here. And once I get it really close, I'm gonna attach it, run it over here, and we'll put this on the groove. My vertical to go straight here. Okay. So what you're seeing right there is a ridge because this is a stamper, obviously. It is the negative and it's going to make vinyl, so then that'll be your positive. And what I'm doing is I'm just trying to get these lines to all go the same way. It's kind of like a strobe tuning thing. You want everything to go the same way. I'm getting really close there now. Oh, so you get the knobs are adjusting. Yeah, the knobs, the knobs just move it just a little bit on the edge of the table there. Okay. So you look at the high side. Okay. And this is a real one, so I got to make sure I got it or they won't like me out in the press room. Okay, so that's what it looks like when it's centered and ready to be punched. And then I punch the center hole, which is part of what determines where the record center hole will be later. And then it comes off that magnetic table like that. And it goes in this machine right over here. And this guy right here, this is my buddy Simon. This is my best friend in plating. When they see me in here talking to myself, this is my excuse because I'm not talking to myself, I'm talking so, to Simon. So Simon is the key man here. He essentially does in one step what all this other machinery does. The other machinery is a backup. Which we don't like it when I have to use that, Simon, so be good, man. We're cool. <laughs> if Simon gets sick, he has to go to Connecticut because we can't actually put new dyes in him here. They have to be like harmonically balanced. It's How much stamp crazy. What's that? How much stamping pressure? On here, I'm not sure. Enough. A lot. <laughs> That's why it's got the safety mechanism where you have to use both fingers on each side so yeah. you can't put anything in there. So this is what it looks like when it's done and ready to go out to the press. What Simon did was he formed this inner ring for the collar there so that the center pin will lock in and hold it. He formed the outer ring on the outside. He dulled it so it won't cut any of the pressers. He formed the outer ring and he cut that scrap off of the edge. He's my man. <laughs> and this is Chris Stapleton's new release is what we're working on right here. And then I weigh them and put them in a folder. And when I was telling somebody a little bit ago, she was wondering how much they weigh. They weigh in between 155 to 170 grams. And we have to keep them a close weight because if you have a heavy one and a light one, when these go on the press, there's a plastic mylar that goes in between there and the die. And if you have a light stamper, it will force a crease in it. Any other questions? All right. Sandwich Thank you. Ladies.
little discs in there. You don't want to put your fingers in here at all. To kind of turn this the coming attractions part of the tour, um, give you a little insight as to what we're working on. When we hit the press room, you're going to notice a blank open space in front of the press room doors. This is what's going into that blank open space. Uh, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, we acquired a number of old, uh, out of shape presses from a defunct pressing plant in Chicago. Uh, Music Products, I believe was her name. And last in operation about 1994. Uh, Chad and Gary were able to go to Chicago after hearing that there might be presses available because they're like gold these days and no matter what shape they're in. Uh, they located uh, Joel who owned the presses and intended to start his own pressing plant and were able to strike a deal. So we wound up with 13 SMTs and then later acquired another fine belt from a place in Nebraska. But we have been engaged since in turning those piles of junk into respectable, essentially brand new presses. And we're close. Uh, we've got six presses that are almost ready to hit the shop floor. Uh, we're in the process now. We've cleared out space. We've begun the piping process to bring those presses online. Imagine there's a lot of utility work, a lot of preparation that has to happen to do that. Um, so the presses are in shape, it's now just getting the building ready to receive those. That's going to bring us to 18 total restored presses uh, that we have. Put just, put just solidly in the middle for size. Um, we are considered a, a solid mid-size plant. The largest presser in the country is United Pressing in Nashville. And if we do, with these new presses, we'll be doing in excess of 2 million records a year. The plants press a lot more records than what gets reported as sold. And nobody wants big inventories. They're not pressing records to collect them on shelves. Correct. So right. it's fake news. Okay. <laughs> uh, SMT stands for Southern Machine and Tool. Uh, the company is no longer in business, but their presses live on, and they're in use in uh, most of the pressing plants in the country, uh, along with Tulex presses, which we also have, which were originally made in Sweden. Well, right now, we're just going to be happy if we can get the six fixed up and going and, and add those to our stock. Uh, the future, uh, it's going to be up to Chad whether he wants to try and fix up more or just keep those uh, in storage for parts. Uh, to give you some idea, this press be behind you, this behemoth, is a Leonard press. Leonard is another American press brand. But this is a good representation of what we were starting with. This is actually a dual seven inch press. And it's one that we don't intend to, to fix up or put back into shape, because we don't do seven inch records. We only do 12 inch records. You know the history of this company, Len Ed? There's a guy named Len and a guy named Ed. Okay, I wonder. Seriously. Okay. And there's a whole story about it that was written in, written up in a British literary magazine. Okay. Which you can't find online, but it's, a, it's an amazing story. And and these presses are what they use at Rainbow. Oh, They're all okay. Len Ed presses because the owner of Rainbow married the daughter of either Len or Ed. I can't remember oh, which one. And that's okay. how we got in the record business. Okay. I'm done. But you can, you can see it's pretty nasty looking, and that's pretty much the shape these others were in. The warehouse where these were stored was leaky, uh, wasn't climate controlled at all. This is Mark Huggett, who's our mechanical superintendent and uh, has led the restoration process. Uh, Hero. He says Hero. Not, and, th and this is the guy that pushed the other side of the button when Chad was pushing to press our very first record. He was involved in that. He was. But uh, Mark likes to say Chad promised him, what, a three-month job and you've been yeah, here three years. Yeah, three months and I was there three years and then I went home and it wasn't but a couple of years before he had me back again and I've been kind of stuck here ever since. Mark, Mark and Gary started their career in pressing at a pressing plant in Phoenix called Wakefield Manufacturing. That's no longer in business. But from Wakefield, they went to uh, RTI, which if you're a collector stands for Record Technology Incorporated. It's a well-known pressing plant in California. 
and Gary was head of uh, pressing or plating, pressing quality control. Kind of did the same thing there, uh, except here he's the boss. So. That's what they look like when when, when I get them. <laughs> so once we have metal plates ready to go on the press. We're ready to press, but we had to have material to, to do the pressing with. And what that amounts to is PVC pellets. And this is what uh, those look like. Essentially, you could call these baby record seeds if you wanted to. <laughs> um, and what happens is these pellets will go into our press. They're melted by an extruder, which is attached to the press, and they're melted into a puck shape, or what we call the biscuit. The biscuit is actually the foundation for the record. We get our plastic from Thai Plastic and Chemical. It's actually a company that's manufactured in Thailand and brought to the U.S. in container ships. And... I was there. You were there. You were there this summer. There's a video up you can watch yeah. on my YouTube channel. On uh, analog, analogplanet.com. Thank you. Find a video. Thank you. How many albums would that be? Okay, I'm gonna mark. Good question. Come here. You and I did the math last year on this. I'm thinking it was 5,200 gram records per octaner. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> 5,000 records? Yeah, 200 gram. Yeah. Each of these containers, it's called an octaner. When it's full, it weighs a ton. We get about 20 of these at a shot, about every three weeks. So we go through a lot. This is all black vinyl, by the way. Black is still by far the most traditional, uh, most used color, although we certainly do a lot of colored vinyl pressing. And in the old days, colored vinyl was a sound, seen as sounding inferior to black vinyl. It's not anymore. It's pretty much been engineered out, so the difference, the distinction between is minimal uh, at best. So again, the area that you're standing in, is uh, going to have old new presses uh, soon. We hope maybe by the first of the year, or the uh, end of the year, maybe shortly after the first. How many shifts? Uh, two what? shifts. Two shifts. Two shifts. Five days a week. Okay. Uh, the pellets go into the back of the hopper on the machine. They get melded uh, into the biscuit. And uh, like I said, the labels you'll see, they press into the biscuit. The biscuit goes into the uh, space where the posts are and that's where the plates are attached. The plates come together under hydraulic pressure. The record is formed. Steam is actually what heats the plates, but midway through the cycle, a valve turns on the machine and the steam gets replaced with chilled water. So it goes from 280 some degrees, it flash cools down to about 100 degrees. At that point, the vinyl hardens instantly, and that's where it becomes the record. Let's go on in and take a look. is going to create the spindle hole.
the hand presses, the fine built hand presses. They're they're kind of like uh, waffle irons. And that's Gary Salstrom. He is the, the 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 he's the guru that runs this plant basically, especially the plating facility. I hope you enjoyed looking around. It's hard to see what's going on inside these presses, but we did the best we can. Rejection rate of records here is higher probably than most other plants. It's allowed us to maintain a, a reputation. We'd rather produce really high quality, great sounding records than mass production. And it allows the record to actually sound better. Uh, this gets more into an engineering area that I'm less comfortable about talking about. Uh, sometimes people ask us about our jackets. Uh, jackets are about the only printed thing that we outsource anymore. We print our own labels. We have a four color sheet press in a building not too far away from here. We print labels, we print our inserts, uh, we print uh, promotional materials, posters. But the jackets, we turn to Stoughton Printing in California for most of it. Well, for our analog productions reissues. Now, if it's a job for Sony or Universal, uh, we just require that they send us the, the jacket and other paper goods ahead of when we start pressing so that there's no slowdown once it hits packaging. But those jackets or inserts or whatever may have been printed somewhere else. Ross Ellis is a big uh, jacket maker. Uh, there's some others out there. There's a tour of Stout and Printing, just by coincidence, on my website. You can watch it. It's an interesting, interesting tour, too. And uh, Jack Stoughton, I think... Analog it, Planet. Uh, Jack Stoughton is the owner of Stoughton Printing, and Rob Marchand is their production manager, and I think both of them are supposed to be wandering around this weekend, too, so you might, might bump into them. So this is done by hand. They're giving it a visual inspection when they take it off the spindle. They put it into the sleeve and the sleeve into the jacket, so hopefully if there's a big scratch or an off-center spindle hole or any various other things that can happen, we catch much of that. I won't say we catch 100%, but it's a much higher ratio than other plants. We love Canadian over here. That's awesome. We don't have any over here last year. Yeah, we're the What's really interesting is you see records here being pressed again that were released a couple of years ago. Ah, here's the Jillian. Well, this is such a fantastic record. It's going to be across the street if you haven't already to the warehouse. And uh, that's, that's the uh, audiophile music fan in general. It's the Goody Warehouse because it's where you can buy uh, as much vinyl as your heart's content along with the SACDs, Blu-ray, any sort of high resolution format, physical format. So that's it? That's everything? That's everything. Not very impressive. <laughs>
If this is the best you can do, I don't know why I drove out here for this. And that's on YouTube? <laughs> it will be. Oh, All right. No. They know I'm Head kidding. Head to the though. open door. Okay, so now we're in the, uh, in, like when you buy a record from, uh, from Analog Productions for Acoustic Sounds, here's where they pack it and ship it off to you. What's missing? What's your collection missing? You know, that's a scary thing. What's that? But, like, I've got... That's, uh, that's neat. Like 15,000 records, and I come here and look through the... I don't have most of the records here. <laughs> well, there's an opportunity for you. Oh, yeah. To get divorced? Yeah. That's, that, that's the big opportunity. This is overwhelming. You can just... You could just... Look, the Neko case box. The Freddie Mercury box. I didn't know about some of these records. That was Bob's. That was Bob's record of. Uh, that was Bob's three record uh, album of standards from the the Great American Songbook. I would, I would want Bruce Dickinson's slow work. I'd want that. Here's the Kinks box. That's great. The Ramones Deluxe Addiction. There's just so many records here. The Definitive Vince Giraldi. I could throw all my records out and start over again and end up with just as many records, none of which I have or I've ever heard. It's just insane. Oh, the Smiths, that's John Atkinson's favorite band. Are you enjoying going through this? I hope you're enjoying it because I am. <coughs> Nina Simone box. That is worth having. It is essential. I have to write it up. I haven't written it up. Air of the Virgin Suicides. That's good. Charlie Parker, The Complete Savoy. I have this on a CD when it came out. I didn't even know they put it out on vinyl. It's just crazy what's here. It's just crazy. I'll take one of each. Thank you. In the old days, I would have taken two of each, but now it slowed down. Okay, these are old Chad stuff here. Just gonna go through it and oh, this is the one. I probably have. I have this one. The Yellow Dog Blues and other favorites. I gotta find my copy. But someone just told me about this. I think I have it when Chad first pressed it in the '90s. They cut the first this. lacquer. This is what notates what lathe it was cut off. The first this is the first time they've used the TML M stamp since since Doug Sachs passed away, I guess. 
<laughs> the lighting. Yeah, Pressure's light. on. God, this light is. Is that loud? I need to see. Let's see. Turn that. Turn that first one to the left off. No, it's an intimate stand. <laughs> you fly back on. No, I can like this. This is nice, Chris. Uh, it's a it's not a bad Stop idea. tape. I know. It's not <laughs> Is it too much? Yeah, it's yeah. like the lighting. Okay. This thing, is there, can there be a light bulb? This thing needs to have a light bulb. Oh. Uh, I, can go. I, I now declare this lathe open. Actually. Does that help? Not really. Okay. That just shot? I don't know, it was working. Right. Don't give me one of those. Yeah, don't don't give me one so of those. So they cut the first yeah, lacquer, the lacquer, did a direct to disc, and these ones. And this is it. It looks nice. Three tracks. Yeah, three tracks. Three tracks of sweating. <laughs> yeah, but you did Not it. Not by them. <laughs> but you did it. Yeah. This is it. I'm having such a hard time seeing this. Let's see if that works. Slowly the Damn. Oh, I thought you got to take a big hammer. No, and no. Bang on it like, like at the end of like Jack, at the end of Dragnet, a Mark Seven. Yeah, you got. <laughs> A big clink clink. Yeah. Is that it? TMLM. Wow. TML is even better. Come on! I shake the shake it. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Uh-huh! Y'all awful quiet. <laughs> Oh, 
Quelque chose est correct, tu vois. Oh, quelque chose est bon en soi. Oh, comme tu dis ça, c'est magnifique, tu vois. Oh, c'est tout bon. Hey, tu veux que tu veux que tu veux que tu veux que tu
didn't play the blues like that when I was 26 years old.